Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline is BYU Head Coach Emeritus, Steve Cleveland, a good friend of the program, joining us from sunny California. Coach, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great, guys. Thank you. We're always feeling good after a win. What was your number one observation from BYU basketball last night against Pepperdine? You know, watching that game, the first half, you could see that they were still making adjustments to playing small a little bit, defensively, offensively, and just kind of understanding their roles. And and consequently, the game was very competitive. Uh, Pepperdine came out and actually shot the ball really, really well, over 50% in the first half, which is a little bit surprising because they're usually always that good at home. But they actually have had some success. You know, Pepperdine's actually kind of been a little bit of a nemesis for BYU. But the second half, they got really comfortable, got really confident uh, at both ends of the floor. And in the first six or seven minutes of the second half, the game was over. So uh, every coach that I know loves to play small. When the floor can be open, your four can shoot the three. It makes it harder to guard. So uh, I, I think that uh, there will be times that BYU is going to have great success playing small. There will be other times where they have to play big because of the nature. When they play Gonzaga, it would be the most obvious time. But they can play small against St. Mary's. So um, I, I like it when they're small. They play with more confidence, and they have so many more options offensively. Coach, we've been talking this morning about just how good Yoli and Elijah are playing. We mentioned they're the top-scoring duo in the conference. How would you describe BYU's dynamic duo? Uh, talented. <laughs> I think that they play in with a great deal of confidence because they're involved in so many ball screens and so much of the action involves the two of them, which it makes it really hard for defenses. But they, they seem to have kind of a, what I, I remember reading a book when I was a young man by Bill Bradley, uh, who, was a, who was a great basketball player for the Knicks. And it was kind of called a sense of where you are. And they always seem to have a sense of where each other is. And as a result of that, they can feed off that. They play with more confidence. And, and they have the skill set to do it. So, the, you know, credit to the coaching staff for putting them in those situations. Um, I think that, uh, you know, when they're off the floor, you really notice how, how badly they're needed on the floor. So staying out of foul trouble, staying healthy is going to be really important for this team going forward with those two. With so much of the conversation still being about trying to find that, that quote-unquote other scorer, do you think, and it's and it's valid. The coaches have talked about it, and certainly see when they when they have that, like they did last night, the outcome. But because there's a lot of focus on that, do, do you think there's a sense of maybe even taking for granted what we're seeing out of Yoli and Elijah? Well, the only time you're going to take something for granted is when they're not on the floor. <laughs> they got to be on the floor, uh, and and yes, I mean every team has expectations, and there are expectations, and they've earned the right to have the ball at special moments in the game. They've earned the right to be involved in, uh, in, in the kind of action they are with ball screens or isolations or just two-on-two -two basketball. So uh, they earned that right. They have confidence in what they're doing. And, and, and truly, and, and you could actually, to, to a certain degree, have to give Hardnett a great deal of credit in terms of Yoli's success because every game I've watched, he just has a sense of where Yoli is and finds him in the right spots. How many lobs has he thrown to him? How many times has he penetrated and dished? So this, as much as Bryant has, has played a big role in their scoring together, Hardnett's really, really, really helped Yoli in terms of getting some easy baskets throughout the game. Coach Steve Cleveland with us on BYU Sports Nation. Coach, I feel like the dynamic duo of Yoli Childs and Elijah Bryant are certainly good enough to help BYU win most of the games that we like to refer to as non-Saint Zaga, beating every other team besides the big two. But are the dynamic duo enough if they play well to help BYU beat the top two? I don't think they are. I think you have to have a third, maybe a fourth consistent score. Where do you stand on that? I, I completely agree with that. And, uh, and that has to be TJ. And, and Zach Sellius will be in, in, involved in that. But it has to be TJ. And I know that uh, I read a little Twitter yesterday that uh, where Coach Shorey talked about TJ being a better player this year than he was last year probably because he's better on the ball defensively. He has more of an understanding, his work ethic. He's a much improved defender. And offensively, his assist to turnover, his shot selection, his spacing, his understanding, all those things make him a better player. And so I think a lot of it is just whether or not he can get his shot back. And 
I can, I'm sure the staff will be constantly looking for ways to get him some quick hitters early on looks. Uh, shots are going to come, but TJ is the guy, and uh, he knows that. He, he, uh, he embraces that. I, he's not someone that's afraid of the moment. He's, he's, he's had the ball in his hands a lot throughout his career in high school and college. And so I'm thinking it's just a matter of time before he starts knocking shots down. And he was really solid last night. Played a good game. You know, Coach, it's a very interesting thing, and it goes with both TJ and Zach, who we were just talking about. By all accounts, you know, they're in the right spots. They're doing all of the right things. It's just the, the shot is not falling. So how do you, as a coach, how do you approach a player like that when they're doing everything they're supposed to do? It's just the shot's not falling. You know, I've had this experience, and there's a mindset issue here uh, that mentally, you know, we we have that doubt. And one of the things that I did, and I had a lot of success with when I had players that were struggling with any part of the game, is that I watched film with them. um, And then watching film with them just to kind of look at little simple and small things. The other thing is, is getting into the gym when no one's around with just that player, just the head coach and that guy, and let's, let's go shoot for an hour. And just talk and have that relationship and let, instill that kind of confidence that you believe in them with nobody else around. And, and those kind of moments, whether it's watching film or just really, really getting tired as a head coach or as an assistant coach and just putting in the time by themselves, that worked really well. And then, and then on, you know, in game situations, you're trying to find ways for them early on. Uh, I would always suggest anybody that's going through a tough shooting slump is, is to try to get layups, get to the free throw line get that confidence, and then coming out of timeouts, run a little pin down screen where, where the big comes directly down at the block and, and TJ comes off and just catch and shoot, those kinds of things, and, and, and practice those things before you get it into the game. So those little quiet moments with those guys, with players, can really be helpful to you know, increase their confidence. Let them know, hey, we keep believing, just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, those are some of the things that I did. Former BYU head basketball coach Steve Cleveland, college basketball analyst on BYUSN. Coach, what kind of challenges arise for a staff and team when you have a home game on Thursday and then you got to go play a road game on Saturday? Well, I'll tell you the difference between today and when I coached is that travel is not an issue anymore. (laughs) (laughs) They can get there really quickly. They're going to actually probably practice uh, uh, on uh, Friday and fly in there Friday, do a shoot around. Uh, so you're not dealing with all of the airport issues and the travel issues. And, and really rest and fatigue is not nearly the situation. Guys are actually able to go to school. So the routine stays the same. So in that sense, what used to be a challenge isn't. But what is a big challenge is, is just game preparation in short periods of time, mentally and emotionally overlooking a 6-10 and 10 team. Now, I can't imagine them overlooking a 6-10 and 10 Santa Clara team when what they went through UOP just a week ago. So I don't think that's going to be a problem. But I, I think the, the key thing is getting them, making sure they're rested. And I, I, I've made that mistake as a coach a couple of times, probably more than a couple of times, where we over-prepare. Keep the preparation simple. Make the game plan simple and something they can believe in. I know, uh, I know one time before an NC2A game, we worked way too hard and got after it, and, and it cost us in the second half of a game. So you want to really protect – their physical condition as well as their emotional, but the travel no longer is a problem, but just making sure they're rested and keep the game plan simple. Everybody knows how good Gonzaga is, St. Mary's, you know, BYU. We, we thought San Diego was, was up there. They end up losing to Pacific last night. With, with all of the changes and some of the, the upsets that we've seen once conference play began, do you know more or less about this conference this far into it? You know what? Uh, I think we still know more. I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at ULP, who shoots 36% field goal, 31 three points, um, and San Diego goes in there and shoots 48% from the field, 45% from the three point, and they get beat. It's weird. But ULP's bench scoring 22 points, and they got to the free throw line 35 times, <laughs> of which they made 33 free throws. <laughs> So that, that did surprise me. I, but on the road, anything can happen. I think we still have a pretty good sense and feel who the top three are. We know that USD and San Francisco are capable, certainly capable of beating BYU uh, at home, uh, San Diego is. But uh, 
I still think we know what this league's all about, but occasionally you'll see those surprises. I didn't see San Diego, but you know what? Nobody saw UOP beating BYU either. So give the UOP staff some credit. Young guys, they had some losses to graduation and transfers, and he's got those guys playing well. Right now, Coach, what kind of a game do you expect between BYU and Santa Clara tomorrow night? I think that it'll be a situation where the first half that uh, they'll be testing and, you know, that it'll be a kind of more – games are always a little more conservative. I think the, the really important thing for BYU, Santa Clara really does not have a post presence offensively. So, you know, the fact that they can establish the post and get to the free throw line early in that game, get to that seven or 18 fouls. But I think that in the second half, I think which is going to be really important is I think pace is going to make a big difference in this game. When BYU can get stops and they can get easy baskets, uh, they've got to take care of the ball. When you go on the road and you turn it over and, and you shoot quick shots, and that's not been happening much, but when that does happen, or you're not defensively ready to play. And that was the thing with, with UOP and, and other games that BYU allows teams to kind of stay in the game early on, and these teams get more confidence from it. And, and really, Santa Clara has no inside presence. They're not, they have three really good guards. Fagan, Hauser, and Caruso are all guys that can go for 15 to 20. But don't settle for quick threes early on. Go side to side. Do what you've been doing. Get, get a little bit of separation at halftime. And then, like last night, win that thing in the first eight or ten minutes of the second half. Coach, the obvious answer to this question is wins and losses because it's the most visible. But we certainly know that there are many more ways to gauge whether or not a team is improved uh, from one season to the next. How do you measure and validate the improvement of a basketball team? Well, first of all, I think for myself and for the fans, they pass the eye test. They see a team that plays together. They see a team that plays hard. I mean, people that don't even know a lot about the game, they can tell when people are unselfish and share the ball. They can tell when young men are playing hard. They can tell when they make smart plays. I mean, not everybody makes every pass and every shot, but that's the improvement that fans and analysts can see. There's execution. There's certainly more accountability. Those are things that they're watching and seeing. They're 14-4, and four, which is outstanding record. A really, really good chance that they'll be 17-4 and four going into that St. Mary's game. And uh, I think the thing right now, the, the biggest issue is w the depth issues. I think if Dalton Nixon can get healthy in the next couple of weeks, he'll be, uh, he'll be a really welcome addition. I think as we watch Zach Sellius kind of get a feel defensively as well as offensively in that four spot, that uh, they'll continue. Now, I, I will say one other thing, that you take last year and this year, one of the, so we talked about passing the eye test and what's going on. The fact is that not having Mika and Emery, I mean, we can say what we want about all the ifs, ands, and buts, but at the end of the day, those are two pretty good players, and, and depth has been a little bit of an issue. The cannon has come in and given them a nice boost in some games, but I think sometimes we look at this team and forget that they're missing a couple of pretty big pieces that they had last year, and, uh, and, and probably last year didn't play with the same execution and IQ that they are this year, so uh, when I look at this, they pass the eye test, and, uh, and and they'll continue to get better. And you know, if they can continue to avoid a few of those upsets on the road, uh, they'll be right in this thing and really prepared when the conference tournament comes to, to win three games in a row. Coach, it's always educational. We appreciate your time so much. And uh, apparently, Dave McCann knows a thing or two about uh, your man cave there in Fresno. Is that where you're going to be watching the game tomorrow night? <laughs> You know, I, I watch the game of my I, I, my house. I'm in a rental house right now, guys. It's small. <laughs> it's about the size of a trailer, and, uh, and 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 I'm hopeful to start building a home here in the next month or so. But I got a nice, comfortable place to watch the games. So uh, tell my boy Dave McCann hello for me. <laughs> okay, we'll pass along the message, Coach. Great to talk to you as always. Good luck, guys. Have a great weekend. You got it.